Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about biomineralization. Specifically, this is the part one biomineralization video where we will go over the difference between induced and controlled biomineralization and introduce the examples of types of minerals that can form from both types of these processes. And then we'll go over the specific mechanisms that control those biomineralization processes of those specific mineral examples in the upcoming biomineralization videos. So let's get started. There are two main types of biomineralization. I pretty much already just mentioned them, induced and controlled biomineralization. And from these pictures, you can kind of already get a sense of what this means. Basically, bioinduced biomineralization is when minerals form as a byproduct of microbial activity. Now, I say metabolic activity here, but it's not all the time that metabolic activity actually plays a role in biologically induced biomineralization. Gosh, that's a mouthful. Actually, by releasing metabolic wastes, causing the reduction or oxidation of specific compounds, or just providing a charged cell surface for minerals to nucleate on, these microbes can induce mineralization of specific minerals that then we call formed by biologically induced biomineralization. And as we see here, providing a charged surface doesn't necessarily have anything to do with metabolic activity, so it doesn't have to be due to metabolism per se. And you can tell that these are somewhat passive processes, but in the case of biologically controlled biomineralization, organisms precipitate minerals to serve some sort of physiological purpose. And so this is a more controlled mechanism and a more active role that the microbes are playing in this process. And the exact role that they're playing is by using their intra or epicellular organic matrices to bind specific ions for mineralization. And in this case, the cell is actively controlling the conditions for mineralization. Therefore, the mineral can form even though the surrounding environment might not have conditions thermodynamically favorable for that mineral to form if it had been an abiotic process. So the microbe or bacteria or whatever organism that is causing the biomineralization or controlling the biomineralization of this mineral is necessary for the mineralization to take place. It's not only catalyzing the process, it's causing and controlling the process because it's creating a microenvironment thermodynamically favorable for that mineral to form. And then once it is formed, it is using that mineral for some physiological purpose in most cases. We'll talk about more examples where that might not always be the case. <laughs> but in the case of both induced and controlled biomineralization processes, they're both governed by the same thermodynamic principles as abiotic mechanisms are. One difference, however, is that organisms precipitate amorphous minerals most often rather than crystalline minerals. What does this mean? Well, amorphous is just not super well organized in crystal structure, whereas crystalline is, you know, the atoms are organized in an arranged structure or pattern. And the tendency toward amorphous minerals for biomineralization is because of the metastability upon formation under low temperature conditions. Under higher temperature conditions where abiotic mineralization takes place, crystalline minerals typically form and are more stable under those conditions, therefore form in these structured, arranged atomic structures and are called crystalline. And because of the metastability of the formation of amorphous minerals under biomineralization conditions, these minerals are often replaced later on by more crystalline, stable forms. For example, the transformation of aragonite to calcite, which I talk more about in my fossil preservation video. I'll link it up here if you want to check it out. But that transformation is due to the greater stability of calcite than aragonite. In terms of the thermodynamic principles that do govern mineralization, like we were talking about, they govern abiotic as well as biogenic mineralization processes. I actually talk about these in the igneous petrology textures video. If you want to check it out, I'll link it up here. But basically, we talk about in that video Gibbs free energy, activation energy, mineral nucleation versus mineral growth, and crystal grain size that results from certain nucleation and growth conditions. I never really thought that one of my videos from igneous petrology would correlate so well with my geobiology videos, but they do. So there you go. That's just proof that geological sciences intertwines all of the sciences. So moving on 
Anyway, in this video, we will be discussing how exactly biology can induce mineralization as shown briefly up here by this bacterial cell releasing some metabolite that binds with an ion to mineralize a mineral, and alternatively, how biology can control mineralization and what types of minerals result from each of these processes. In the upcoming videos, we'll actually discuss the more specific mechanisms of formation of each one of our example minerals that we will list here in a couple slides. So first, how does biology induce mineralization and what types of minerals result from this process or these processes? So microbes passively contribute to mineral formation by using two main attributes, their reactive surfaces and their metabolism. The reactive surfaces enhance precipitation in supersaturated solutions, meaning solutions supersaturated with respect to the ion or ions that are involved in the mineralization process of a specific mineral. In these solutions, these reactive surfaces enhance precipitation by providing surfaces rich in ionized ligands that can facilitate sorption reactions. So this is a lot of terminology. This really sounds more difficult than it is or more confusing than it is. Really all it means is that typically, like we talked about in the previous bioabsorption video, bacterial cell walls or microbial cell walls in general have generally negatively charged cell surfaces. There are exceptions that have positively charged cell surfaces. I think dust just flew across the <laughs> screen. I don't know if you saw that. I'm going to go back and look at that, but I'm keeping it in. Anyway, Anyway, these cell walls have negatively charged surfaces typically that attract cations to their surface. And so then they have these surfaces laden with cations and anions in the external environment would love to grab onto those cations and form, you know, compounds and eventually maybe minerals. And so these reactive surfaces act as surfaces where minerals can begin or what's called nucleate. So basically they're birthed on that surface before they can actually be Begin to grow and accumulate there. The second process of mineralization is growth of a mineral grain after it's been nucleated. And in the case of passive biologically induced mineralization, the growth process is pretty much abiotic. Once you have the nucleation occur because of the reactive surface of the microbe, you are pretty much growing the mineral based on the chemistry of what's already attached to that surface, not really because of anything that's biological that's going on, uh, but there are also metabolic pathways that do help with mineralization, and that's the second way that microbes can contribute to biologically induced mineral formation. Metabolism is how they gain their energy. Like I mentioned in the previous video over bioremediation and recovery, I talked about how we metabolize oxygen and sugars and create the byproduct of CO2. Well, there are many different organisms with many different metabolic pathways, and like like us, they take up some sort of compound and transform it and release a different byproduct. And this excretion of metabolites or metabolic byproducts can promote mineral growth by providing some sort of compound that can react with ions in the external environment that might not otherwise be able to react with such ions if these bacteria or organisms weren't around. For example, a lot of sulfide minerals wouldn't form if it weren't for a group of bacteria called sulfate reducing bacteria that produce sulfide because they take up sulfate and transform it into sulfide. And because they produce sulfide as a product, sulfide can then react with a bunch of other ions in the solution and form sulfide minerals, which wouldn't be possible without the formation of sulfide by these bacteria because there isn't a lot else in those environments that forms sulfide abiotically. Only in environments like maybe hydrothermal thermal vents are you going to get abiotic production of sulfide and therefore abiotic mineralization of sulfide. But in other cases, the bacteria are what is contributing that sulfide for the mineral formation. And speaking of the different types of minerals that can be formed due to bio-induced mineralization processes, these include iron hydroxides, magnetite, manganese oxides, clays, amorphous silica, carbonates, phosphates, sulfates, and sulfides. And like I mentioned earlier, 
earlier. Anions like carbonate, sulfate, and phosphate all want to grab onto the cations that had absorbed onto the bacterial surface due to its negative surface charge. And this can be applied to a lot of the different things we're talking about here, not just the carbonates, phosphates, and sulfates, but I'm just giving a visual example for you all. So we'll talk about the exact mechanisms behind the formation or biomineralization of these minerals in the upcoming videos, specifically for the first five listed here. We'll talk about in the part two biomineralization video and the last four we'll talk about in the part three biomineralization video. So if they're out and you're curious now, go check those out now. But moving to biocontrolled mineralization and what types of minerals form from this process. So how does it work? First of all, microbes actively control both the nucleation and the growth process in the case of biologically controlled mineralization. And how they do this is by using an intra or intercellular site for their locus of mineralization. Sounds so cool and exclusive, doesn't it? But anyway, in the case of intracellular sites, this means that they have some sort of site that they block off within their cell. They close it off from the external environment and it's normally some sort of like vacuole or something that they then will use to start the mineralization process by the second step, which is bringing ions into that site and then exposing those ions to certain organic ligands, which is the third step listed here in a controlled way to bind those ions and then start to grow the mineral and continue to grow the mineral in an ordered and controlled fashion. However, there are also organisms that use intercellular sites for their locus of mineralization in which they might be multicellular. And so they can use sites in between their cells rather than within their cells. In either case, the mineralization is happening within the organism rather than on the surface of the organism like we saw with bio-induced mineralization. So in the case of bio-controlled mineralization, it's all happening within the cell or organism and they control every step of the way leading to a very controlled output, a very controlled product in terms of their mineral. And that's because it's for a specific function that that organism wants it to be for. <laughs> and examples of minerals that can be formed by biocontrolled mineralization include a list slightly different than what we saw for biologically induced minerals. So what we see here is actually that we don't have our iron hydroxides like we had last time. So we'll take that out, but we do still have magnetite listed here. That mineral can also be formed by biologically controlled mineralization. However, in the case of biocontrolled mineralization, it forms within cells rather than on on the surfaces of cells or in the vicinity of cells as a byproduct. And so our discussion about those mechanisms in the upcoming videos will be a little bit different than in the bio-induced mineralization of magnetite. Moreover, gregite forms more similarly to the biocontrolled magnetite formation in that it's intracellular or intercellular and it is more of a controlled process. We'll talk about those mechanisms as well. And then amorphous silica again, but instead of just a byproduct, again, it's more controlled process. All of these differences between induced and controlled mineralization are like me repeating myself, but literally it's a more controlled process. And in terms of amorphous silica, you might notice that these little shapes here look awful specific and crystalline. And why in the world would you call that amorphous? Because in my brain, at least when I think of amorphous, I think of like blobby. It doesn't really have a structure. But remember that just because the silica is amorphous doesn't mean that the the outcome, the overall mass of mineral is going to turn out to be blobby. What I mean by this is that the individual grains of silica that are produced in these organisms, these are silicified organisms, by the way, in the case of these organisms, the individual grains of silica are amorphous, but they're so tiny and they're so well ordered because they're biologically controlled in their formation that they turn out looking absolutely incredible incredibly arranged and crystalline and immaculate because of their overall morphology when they're done. But the individual grains are amorphous. That's all I wanted to point out there. So anyway, that's amorphous silica. So that's going to be a little different than the biologically induced process as well. And then we have down here, we had manganese oxides and clays. We will not be talking about those in the biologically controlled section of these videos because they are only formed by biologically induced processes rather than controlled processes, at least 
case to our current knowledge. And then we will talk about calcite again in the case of biologically controlled mineralization, but instead of things like ooids, we'll talk more about coccolithophores and forams and other organisms that control their calcite precipitation rather than just making calcite as a byproduct of their metabolic waste or their reactive surfaces. And then if we turn our attention down here, we can see that in the case of the biologically induced mineralization, the ions or anions in this case are going to the mineral surface that adsorbed onto it cations. However, in the case of biologically controlled mineralization, the ions are actually being sought out and captured and taken up into the cell by active enzymatic processes employed by the microbe. And so this is a very different and more controlled process than the induced mineralization we talked about earlier. Again, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but I hope this is making sense and being helpful to you. It's a more controlled process, again. <laughs> And if we move on, we won't actually be talking about phosphate minerals either in the controlled biomineralization sections because there are no phosphate minerals to our knowledge that are biologically controlled in their formation. They're only biologically induced. And so instead, we'll be talking about fossilization processes such as pyridization and silicification as listed over here. Pyridization isn't actually listed, but we'll talk about it in the mineral tissues, coats, casts, and mold section, and silicification, which is the solicification of fossils. And this just means that the fossil converts to being preserved as silica rather than its original organic or calcitic or whatever material it was. And we can see a petrified wood that has been opalized. Here, opal is made of silica. And we can see a close up of this petrified wood in the two images below it with these cool spheroidal silica micro structure things, which are really, really freaking awesome. So we'll talk about those in the upcoming video when we get to the fossilization section. And lastly, before I let you go, I do want to put something in the place of where the manganese oxide thing was, because there is a type of structure that I think is really, really awesome called a dendritic structure or dendrites, which are these tree-like structures. And as you can see, they're really beautiful and they almost look like they'd be a fossil like some sort of plant fossil, but I include these to point out that they're actually not fossils. They're what's called pseudo-fossils. They look like fossils, but they're faking you out. They're not real fossils, and so they have nothing biological to do with their formation, which is why we're not going to be talking about them further in the later videos, but why I also found it useful to mention them here, just so you know moving forward that these structures aren't biologically induced. They're not biologically controlled. They form purely by a biotic processes of manganese oxide dissolution reactions, and they're really cool, but there's nothing biological about them. So that is all for this biomineralization part one video. Like I mentioned, there is a part two and three coming up in which we will talk about the biologically induced mineralization of iron hydroxides, magnetite, manganese oxides, clays, amorphous silica, and then in part three, we'll talk about carbonates, phosphates, sulfates, and sulfides, and those are all biologically induced, whereas in the part four and five videos will talk about biologically controlled precipitation of the rest of the minerals I listed on the previous slide. So I will see you guys there for those videos. Lastly, I am using the book Introduction to Geomicrobiology by Kurt Kahnhauser. This book is really, really cool and it's linked in my description if you want to check it out. All of my other resources and sources are also linked in my description if you want to check those out as well. But before I let you guys go, so comment down below for me which mineral you are most excited to hear about in the upcoming biomineralization videos. The one that personally excites me the most, well, I actually thought it would be sulfides, but after making these power planes, I have to say the one that was most exciting for me and interesting, well, two, actually two. Okay, sorry. The two that were most exciting for me were clays and amorphous silica, which we're talking about in the part two biomineralization video. So go check that out. Hopefully those will also interest you. So so yeah, comment that down below for me. I'm curious what you're most excited for, or if those are out and you've already watched those other videos, let me know which one your favorite was, and I'll see you guys there. Bye!